Now in this video, I want to talk about a company that has a semiconductor chip on its shoulders for a bit now. A lot of people are counting this company out and some for good reason. It has had hiccups along the way, it's made some poor decision making, and at times it was stubborn. Stubborn to adapt correctly and stubborn to pivot the business model. And so here they are. But a lot of people, they just throw this company out because they say AMD, Taiwan Semiconductor, Samsung, they're doing so well. Intel, it's just one of these old, mature companies, and they're not doing that great, and they've fallen off the wagon. They used to be this innovative company. They were the darling of Silicon Valley. They created Silicon Valley but they've given up the lead to these other companies and people just say, you know what? Once you fall off the train, you can't just run after the train and hop back into it and surpass it. Once you fall off, that's it. It's incredibly, incredibly hard. The odds are stacked against you. However, this might be the case when it comes to the really, really high-end chips. We're talking about AI. We're talking about really sophisticated computer chips. However, the chip market is huge. The more research I do about semiconductor space, I realize the demand is so, so big, especially now, that there can't just be one or two players. There's plenty to eat for everyone, and in this space, you don't necessarily have to be a leader in order to thrive. And what I believe is that Intel is gonna be thriving in the next couple of years. Now, you're not gonna see these results by next year. You might see good earnings, you might continue to see good profits, but 2024 going into 2025, that will really dictate where Intel stands because a lot of the things that they have in motion, a lot of their game plan, a lot of the initiatives, a lot of things in R&D that's coming down the pipeline, it is going to come to fruition around 2024, 2025. Now, we can't talk about the semiconductor space without mentioning fabs. What are they? Fabs is a semiconductor fabrication plant. And Intel used to be mocked all the time because they were not fabulous. All these other companies, they started to be fabulous, like AMD, they would just get it from Taiwan Semiconductor. But now with the chip shortage, with the geopolitical landscape tilting in Intel's favor, in having fabs, the game is going to change. I believe that. Because first of all, Taiwan, they're right next to China. I don't know how much you know about the political landscape or governments and regimes, but China is pretty, pretty crazy. And they don't like Taiwan. Also, there's a lot of earthquakes that happen around Taiwan. So for the whole world to just be banking on something like Taiwan Semiconductor is not the wisest thing. The whole world revolves around technology now. There is so much demand in every facet of electronics, semiconductors, chips. I mean, there is in every single industry, it is gravitating towards more and more electronics, more and more technology. And so this really sets up Intel to regain dominance in the chip market. And so when I was researching all these plans that they have for 2024, 2025, I was listening to the interviews. And if you've watched my videos on fundamental analysis, I covered a lot of the metrics. And as I was covering them, things like trailing PE, forward PE, PS, peg ratio, those types of metrics. As I was doing that, I was always comparing Intel to AMD, Intel to Nvidia. And a lot of the time you could see that Intel is actually a great great value play. However, a lot of people will argue it is actually a value trap, that the value looks good, the PE looks great, other things look good, but it's valued low for a reason. But as I dove further, I took a look at the earnings, I took a look at the market share, I took a look at the potential, I took a look at the investments they're making now. They're building out these fabs in Arizona, they're expanding operations in Portland, Oregon. Also, they're doing so much overseas. They're building out in a lot of different countries and they're American made. And the more I listen to Pat Gelsinger, he's well, well respected. And he's been with the company. He was like 19 years old when they brought him on. He grew up at Intel. And after decades of working there, he went to work for another company, but they brought him back recently to turn around the company. And people are counting him out already. I mean, the guy sounds brilliant. He definitely understands Intel. He understands the 
technological landscape. And so I think people need to give more time for him to actually execute on the game plan before they draw decisions. But the fact that people are skeptical of Intel kind of makes sense. I mean, Intel did not do the greatest at pivoting. They've made a lot of mistakes. For instance, they had a chance to work with Apple and they completely dropped the ball on that. They declined to work with Apple and then there was a time, you might remember a few years ago, they were always running these PC commercials because Apple went and they stopped working with Intel on their Macs as well. Intel turned down an offer to work with Apple because they really didn't see the move into the mobile aspect of electronics of technology and they were just strictly focused on what was happening then and working for them then then they had a lot of hiccups when it came to the really really high-end chips there were all these delays and a lot of people will argue that they actually let their lead in the semiconductor space slip away because they were stubborn they wanted to be what's called an idm integrated device manufacturer which means they both design and manufacture the chips. They wanted to control both of that. They wanted to be the great like one-stop shop for everything chips. However, you can't compete if you try to do everything with companies that just do one thing, like Taiwan Semiconductor, that just does the manufacturing aspect. And so now they're actually doubling and tripling down on this strategy because of the chip shortage, because of the geopolitical landscape, they're actually creating more fabs and they have a lot of products in the pipeline that they're promising. The more that I talk to people that are knee deep, neck deep in this space, the opinions vary across the board. And so it just makes me realize that this play, Intel, even though it's done well so far, now I'm gonna show you the exact trade I made. I'm gonna show you which price I bought in. I'm sitting at a profit right now. I have my relatives put money in it. They're sitting at a profit right now. But Intel, it's really, really gonna pay off if they execute and when it comes time for that 2024, 2025. In the meantime, sure, if something crazy is happening in Taiwan, if China flips out and there's a lot of US-China tension or just China and Europe tension, and then people don't really wanna deal with Asia for a bit, Intel is only gonna profit from that. That being said though, I hear that argument as well, but in doing research like Taiwan Semiconductor, they are setting up fabs in America as well, and they have fabs all over the world. So just because it's Taiwan Semiconductor doesn't mean that it's just like right in Taiwan and then they just ship across to the world. They have fabs everywhere as well. But like I said in the beginning of this video, I don't believe the more I do the research, I don't believe that this is something that you have to be a leader in order to really bring in continuous continuously be on profits and bring in more earnings. The whole world is just having this technological revolution and there's such a boom in technology, in electronics, in the demand for chips and things are innovating so rapidly. I mean, it's a rapidly evolving beast technology these days. Like just take a look at your phones. Every single year, it's like a step up, a step up, a step up. Who do you think's creating all that? That is these semiconductor manufacturers. Taiwan Semiconductor is actually partially responsible for the success of Apple. But Taiwan Semiconductor, they just kind of chill. They're like this secret, you know, on the low company. That's a behemoth. Did you know that they're the number 10 company in the entire world as far as market cap? That is huge and they're growing rapidly. And just because I'm making a video on Intel, I'm not saying that AMD or Taiwan Semiconductor isn't a great deal or a company you should look into or even something like Nvidia. But if you take everything into account, so the fundamentals, the technicals, and just the grand scheme of things and the thesis you could put in place as far as where these companies will be five, six years from now, the growth potential of Intel is huge. I would argue the most out of the other companies. The other thing is I'm always weary of investing in companies that have really, really high PE ratios. Because remember, if we're going to go through something crazy in the stock market, usually the companies that get hit the least are the ones with a low PE. And if you look at Intel 
relative to its peers, relative to its competitors, it has a very, very attractive PE along with a lot of the other metrics. Now, something that Intel has gotten a little bit of blowback for is if you look over the past couple of years, they kind of became like just fat and lazy, complacent. They were buying back a lot of shares. And although that's good for the investor and the investors that are in it, they were getting the dividend. They were like, okay, this is good. But the people that are invested in Intel and see it as like a growth story, as this innovative company, they were like, what are you doing? Instead of buying back shares and stuff, take all that cash on your balance sheet, put it into R&D, put it into expansion. And this is why what Pat Gelsinger is doing, and the wheels are very much in motion on his plan, is that he is doing just that. He is saying, no, guys, the whole buyback thing, don't worry about that let's go full steam ahead so that we can compete once again. And the other thing I want to talk about is the geopolitical landscape. The American support for having American-made technology, American-made fabs, semiconductor players. This is something that is not just, you know, we don't really like China and Asia is dominant. They're the chip leader in the world. Like we want to compete just for recognition and stuff. It's kind of like the thing that they say, like China surpassed America as far as education. Like we're trying to get it back. This is different. It is crucial for domestic and international strategy to have high tech military capability. And so do you really want to get your chips from Asia that are you're putting into American tanks? Remember, chips, they're so, so small. You don't know what people can fit into those chips. Like, it's crazy. I talked to some specialists, and they said, like, theoretically, you could put some, like, tracking stuff in there where, you know, it can collect data, send it elsewhere. We're talking about, like, microscopic nanotechnology that goes into these chips. Do you really want to have that produced anywhere aside from the United States? And if you're a player in Europe, if you're a government in Europe, do you want to do a deal with an American-made company or someone in Asia that's filtering through Asia? Now, of course, Taiwan is not China, but it's something that has a little bit of play and makes sense to me that we are working towards having something American made and we should champion that and America is. For instance, there's the CHIPS Act that has $52 billion in subsidies. By the way, if you're not familiar with subsidies, that's just another word for the government giving companies or people incentive to do something. So we hear a lot about it in the EV space because there's subsidies for these electrical vehicle companies to produce EVs because it's good for the environment. And so a subsidy is just a way to motivate people, businesses with grants, with tax discounts, so that they go ahead and they do certain things that the government wants done. And so since 2015, by the way, China has allocated $180 billion to this space, to the semiconductor space, encouraging a lot of innovation, R&D, expansion, fabs. And so this is not something where we want China to be the leader in the world when it comes to chips and AI and high-end technology. And so I think that if America backs this, if Pat Gelsinger once again reinvigorates the company, puts some motivation and inspiration back into the Intel workforce and kind of just encourages innovation, R&D, and implements good plans, actually executes on them, and hits the time goals. Because remember, the deadlines of Intel, they've been missed quite a bit. And that's one of the things that turned off investors and turned off tech enthusiasts. If you ever watch in the past three years, like I have, when new chips come out and you have these review videos on the chips, oh my God, Intel gets just tortured. But Reading the reviews, reading what people have said about Intel in the past couple of years, you would think that the company is in the dirt and that its valuations are trash and its profits diminishing and earnings are diminishing, but it's actually beating on the top and bottom line. And I'm going to show you that in a second. All right, guys, so I'm going to zip through this section because I'm probably going to make a different video on the fundamentals and technicals of Intel stock because I don't want this video to be like 40 minutes long. No one ever watches videos that long, but I will just let you know 
that the market cap of Intel sits at $226 billion. Currently, it trades at $55.77. It is January 11th, 2022 right now. And if we scroll down and we look at the quarter release and annuals, nothing over here screams that Intel is in trouble. Now, are they experiencing exponential growth right now? Absolutely not. But they're still doing well over this past year, given what's been happening. Now, I'm going to link a couple of articles because I think it's really, really important to stay up to date with what's happening in the Intel world. And right here, you see that Intel is investing $7 billion in a new plant in Malaysia, which is going to create 9,000 jobs. And this is just to point out that Intel is very much global. It has fabs and factories all over the world. Also, Intel plans to catch Samsung and TSMC and regain its dominance in the chip market. I covered some of this, but I'm going to link this article as well because they do a great job detailing Pat Gelsinger's plan to once again regain dominance in the chip space. Intel is spending $20 billion to build two new chip plants in Arizona. I believe I mentioned this, but I'm going to link the article. Go ahead, read through that. And then I want you guys to be familiar with the CHIPS Act and the fabs act as well i touched upon the chips act but there's something called the fabs act you should definitely be up to date on it if you're looking to educate yourself on intel and potentially become an investor remember none of this is financial advice this is just my opinion i'm a stock market enthusiast and lastly i want you to take a look here as always i show you my exact positions on this channel don't hide anything from you guys with intel i was so sure about it after doing my research that i didn't just average in i didn't buy 50 shares then another 50 shares i just on november 30th purchased 200 shares of intel at a price of 49 dollars and 30 cents and as you can see my total gains over 1300 and over 13 percent but i'm not too worried about this i mean it's great to see i would rather be in the green than in the red but i'm really in this for the long haul i'm looking at 2024 2025 if pat gelsinger and intel can execute on even 90 percent of the game plan I think that Intel will be sitting at over $100, but we shall see what's going to happen. For me, I'm very comfortable having my money tied up in a great tech play like this that has low PE values. So I really appreciate you guys watching this video in its entirety. If you're somebody that's been following the semiconductor space for a while, maybe you're a tech enthusiast, maybe you're a tech expert, tech professional, maybe you work in a fab or you've worked for Intel, Taiwan Semiconductor, AMD, Nvidia, any one of these tech giants, and you have some good, good insights, please do share. I mean, we're all trying to learn uh, from one another. I'm by no means an expert in the space. I'm just somebody that's trying to do good DD. I saw this as an opportunity. I went in what seems to be at the right time. And for me, I'm very comfortable having my money tied up in this right now, especially with all this craziness with inflation and not knowing what's going to happen. I think a company like Intel that's highly profitable and I think is only going to continue raking in the profits and with the chip shortage, with the geopolitical landscape, with the tensions with Asia, I really do think that Intel can be a comeback story here. And especially if in 2024, 2025, they start releasing some of this technology that they're saying that they're working on and they could regain the lead in the semiconductor space, in the chip space. Oh my God, it would be amazing. What a comeback story that would be. And so in the next couple of years, as Intel with Pat Gelsinger at the helm is traversing down this game plan that they have, as there's highlights or hurdles or milestones, I'm most likely gonna be making videos about it. Hopefully it's positive videos where we're all celebrating and I stack some more on that chips over there. But We'll see what happens. I appreciate you guys for watching. Let me know which stock, which crypto, which options trading strategy you wish for me to cover next and what your overall thoughts are on this topic. I'll see you guys in the next video.